Okay, great. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming here. We're, um, our panel is CLOs in the Evolving Marketplace. Um, there's a lot to unpack today. So we've got a panel of um, some great folks um, who are going to talk about what they see in the credit markets. And, and really, when we had the, the, um, the title CLOs in the Evolving Marketplace, really what we're talking about funding solutions for corporate America. That's really what it was. Next time I'll do a better thing, but they asked me on a Thursday, I had to give a response on a Friday. But what we're gonna have is we'll have perspectives from different parts of the market. Um, we're uh, Mark David, and we're gonna go in, not the order that we have, but Mark David, who's a managing director at Green Slabs, he's you know, really focused on um, the middle market space and you know, kind of the smaller EBITDA type uh, companies that, um, you know, that are a part of the economy and I expect to grow. Um, based on some of the data that has come out, we have Oliver Dunchy, who is a effectively, a, a, you know, he's the head of uh, you know kind of financing solutions for companies. And 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 what Oliver is going to talk about is, um, you know, having a diversified sor funding sources. You know, indirectly, we need the CLO market and the ABL market provide a huge amount of funding. Uh, we're not going to talk about the sort of CLO funds that are out there, but provide a huge funding source. Um, and how those, you know, how that market evolves. I've got Alex Huon, who um, is a senior transactor at uh, Citigroup and talking about the broadly syndicated market. And, um, you know, is gonna give you a perspective of where that market is, obviously a tumultuous time for us all. Um, and then lastly, but firstly, will be uh, Mark Feeney, who is a managing director at Morgan Stanley Investment Management who is on the manager side. So he's, he's the guy looking at credits. He's the guy looking at, um, you know, where the market is. Um, you've got COVID-19, you've got vaccines potentially in there. You've got um, a new administration potentially, you know, who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking Biden's in, but who knows? But, and so as a manager, you know, the first thing I'd like to get your perspective of the credit markets, because you, you got a hard job you got a lot of information to digest in terms of, um, you know, what you see in the market in terms of analyzing how the, you know, the credit markets look. So if you can give you a perspective of this from your, you know, kind of view in this and, um, and where the market is. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And it's a, a pleasure to, to be part of the virtual uh, panel. Um, and thanks, Neil, for for the uh, the introduction uh, again, Mike Feeney from uh, Morgan Stanley Investment Management um, manage uh, six vehicles now, about two and a half, uh, two point six billion of AUM. So, um, so it's been a wild it's been a wild twenty twenty as we can all uh, attest to. I think um, maybe just touch quickly on kind of where we where we've come from and where we are now. Um, as volatile as the ride down was, I think in in March um, it was equally as eye opening as the, the ride back. Uh, within the loan asset class and, and um, some driven um, by technicals. And, and I think we've probably mentioned Fed stimulus probably already at this uh, CLO symposium, probably, you know, a couple dozen times, but really that was the biggest driver on the rally back in loan prices. It was the Fed stimulus, but it went beyond that. It went, uh, there was some several technical and, and fundamental drivers that really led our way back. Um, and we can certainly talk about sectors specifically. Um, and really one of those drivers was just the company's ability to, um, you know, which overwhelmed us a little bit, was just the company's ability to be nimble, um, the company's ability to redefine how they generate revenues, company's ability to provide liquidity bridges um, for what was and continues to be an uncertain uh, gap in liquidity for a lot of these companies. Um, they were very quickly able to piece together um, uh, liquidity, whether it's from private equity, whether it was, you know, the, the high yield bond market opened up before our loan market did. And so a lot of the direct COVID related companies were able to bring kind of five year secured bond deals that really was the first, um, the first phase of healing for a lot of these companies to plug what was, um, you know, an undefined liquidity gap. Um, then came junior levels of capital, private equity, uh, other junior capital, and then kind of the last wave of liquidity was senior secured loans, um, you know, incremental loans that often came pari passu to uh, existing senior secured lenders, but again, padded liquidity, so you, you didn't mind being diluted in your collateral because you were, you were bridging these companies to, uh, to hopefully better days. Um, from a perspective of kind of the industry's effective, and I, I'm not quite sure if there was one that was, was uh, um, that wasn't impacted, obviously, by the pandemic. And the irony, irony of it all was 
um, some positive of the or problems. negative, right? <laughs> <You> exactly, <know. laughs> exactly. The irony of it all is some of the the healthiest industries going in, where um, we were um, pretty positioned in a long perspective, leisure, lodging, gaming, um, entertainment, uh, anywhere that uh, any sector that really leveraged or benefited from a, a strong U.S. consumer is is you felt really good about pre-COVID. Next thing you know, a couple of weeks later, and everything was turned on its head. So how how do you adapt to that? How do you how do you um, per, per, per Bill Ackman, you know, you got to take a long view on some of these things. And I got to believe people are going to go back and gamble. Yeah, absolutely. Gaming is actually, yeah, gaming has held up pretty well um, uh, of all those sectors. Yeah, you you want to invest in online gaming and then it'll transition back because I guarantee people will go back and game. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so some of our exposure in gaming was multi-jurisdictional and online. So, you know, on the cover, it was a big uh, overweight, but when you kind of delved into the, the actual credits, it was, you felt decent about it, but that was the irony of it all. And then you had essentially COVID, the second segment of industries, you had COVID really almost be the final nail in some of these companies and industries coffins and, and pardon the expression, but um, you know, you had companies that were struggling pre COVID um, and we can all name a whole bunch of them, uh, mostly in retail and a lot in energy, metals and mining, uh, that were really tr hard, having a hard time navigating their environment. And then the COVID hit, um, and it really was just, um, you know, one of those final nails that has led to 11 year high in default rates. And, and I think most of us, I think on this, on this panel, and certainly S&P does, um, expects kind of that default rate to continue to to, to continue to spike um, higher uh, as we as we go along, and then to Neil's point, you had some industries that actually either were uh, immune or benefited from this, whether it was pharma, whether it was health, other healthcare services, um, whether it was telecom, cable, uh, certain segments of technology. You actually had um, several companies and industry sub segments really benefit from this and be, have the ability to generate strong free cash flow, which has really positioned them well um, heading into 2021. So, but if you think about it, you know, you have, you know, some industries where you think you take a long run view that it's going to be positive, you're going to get some downgrades that affects how you manage your portfolio, right? I mean, near term downgrades, long term, they're going to recover, but you manage within a structured vehicle and you've got to take that into consideration as opposed to a fund where it's a different dynamic. Absolutely. It's one of the biggest challenges, I think, of COVID for CLO managers was navigating the downgrade cycle and knowing that you were perhaps blowing through triple C baskets, exactly what to do with those. Do you sell and kind of materialize those losses um, and really lock those losses in? Um, or do you kind of try and navigate and have some patience um, if you really do believe there's real long term value in the names that you've invested in? Um, you know, do you have enough patience and, and, and do you have enough fortitude to actually have that ability for that patience to kind of watch that play yeah, out? And it's not, it's not only you, it's the investors calling you up and saying, what do you think, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think our stance was, you know, we certainly made our mistakes. Um, we, we definitely have. Um, but I think our stance was when we underwrite credit, we, we really do under, underwrite through cycles and no one would have imagined what we were going to experience. I mean, I, I would love to meet the person that, that has. Yep. Um, but for the most part, we really tried Still to, lacking. yeah, yeah exactly. that's very true. That's very true. For the most part, we really tried to, um, you know, take a long-term view and, and not be um, at the mercy of the short-term pressures that a CLO vehicle uh, may create or investors of that CLO vehicle may, may place upon you. And I think the most, really the most interaction, the most conversations we had with our investors, uh, we were very much aligned. Um, there was very much a patience. Let's wait and see how this all plays out. And especially as those bridges of liquidity were put in place, um, very rarely, and it's absolutely in certain um, circumstances, but very rarely was it going to be a liquidity shortfall that, that pushed you in. So I feel like not only was it a great solution for companies, but actually managing those credits, knowing that those bridges were in place, it afforded you to be a little bit more patient um, to kind of watch things play out. And fortunately, up until this point, that patience has, has caused some real healing and then obviously an incredible rebound in asset prices. Well, I mean, and then we're expecting who knows what right now, I mean, because we have this huge spike, which is going to impact decisions. And you got to tell investors that, you know, certain credits we think are not so good. Other credits, we think it's a temporary thing and they're likely to upgrade. And you got to go out. You're actually going to have to really work for your money right now. You know, Absolutely. Great, I mean, when I, I was like, it's great to be a rock star in a boom economy. And <laughs> then you got to really show yourself because you got to prove yourself a year later and two years later when you go market a deal. Right. And say, how did you think about this credit? 
And um, one of the things that Alex will get to is just touching on, you know, just the new restructuring language and deals and stuff. We have a panel that's going to really go into that in depth. But the reality of it is, is that um, it's a flexible structure. Um, but even through the biggest downturn during 2008, nine, whatever, uh, one or two deals defaulted, everything acted like it should have, and then things rebound. So, you know, I think that's the, the struggle. But I mean, I, I personally sympathize with you because you, I think you have a, you're in a tough decision about trying to say, okay, so what is Biden going to do? What is it? Do we win the Senate? Do we, you know, do, I mean, that does the, the Republicans win the Senate, which tempers what the, the House is, but the House is narrowed as well. So it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, trying to manage, you know, 180 to 220 leverage loan names and try and marry that fundamental bottom up philosophy with potential outcomes in Washington. <laughs> I would really love to meet the person that's been able to, to do that quite well. You know, I think it, the expectation going in four years ago. Well, and it, how depends the on, it depends on where you're, where, what you're pitching, right? You know, yeah, um, personally. That's, that's true. How the markets reacted four years ago versus I think what the expectation was. I think it, it you know, it surprised, it certainly surprised me a little bit. So, um, you know, we pride ourselves on fundamental bottom up credit selection. Um, again, we've made some mistakes, but we think we, um, you know, I think that the key to navigating these waters are identifying those mistakes early um, and, and being able to identify what is going away from the thesis, not on a short term basis, but from a long term perspective and try and identify those those occurrences and try to exit those 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 names, to be honest, when 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 there's minimal damage associated with those names, not large damage, which is which yeah. is eventually. And, it, and, and you guys, through. you're an interesting space where you got to manage for the debt and the equity and everybody in between. Um, and I think that, um, so, I, you know, one of the things in terms of just looking forward, which I, others will touch on is collateral availability mm -hmm. um, for new deals. I mean, right now, lots of resets. We've got a new issue deal. We've got a couple, we've got a lot of activity, um, but, you know, collateral availability and, you know, what puts a portfolio together, because I think I want Alex to touch on that as well, because he's got to go market this deal. And he's got to go deal with investors who may not understand it as completely as you do. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think of all the times, the years we've been doing this, collateral availability doesn't really uh, concern me all that much, especially where secondaries are trading. So you can actually go out and 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 put together a, a pretty decent, high quality portfolio, you know, of double B and single B loans that. Um, given the new issue kind of premiums that have come, you actually can get some real spread out of those as well. Um, and you can create that portfolio at 98 and a half, 99 ish dollar price. Um, and given where CLO liabilities are today, um, they're quite constructive as well. I think the, what we've seen a little bit from, from the latest pricings of deals since markets kind of reopened was almost a, a re-tiering of tier one. You almost have tier one A and tier one B and then tier two, tier three. Um, so you really started to see some differentiation. Um, but where things are on the asset side, you're not reliant on a robust new issue calendar to make your CLO work, uh, which is- And, which and is I'm thinking too, and, I'm, and we're gonna, now we're gonna probably s switch on to how you fund these deals, but I'm thinking about, you know, there are certain credits that you'd like to buy, but it's not the right time to buy. Mm -hmm. I mean, or maybe you say, yes, it's a good time to buy because I think that they're going to just swing back, right? Because uh, again, Bill was Bill has his own views, and Bill tries to act and tries to run the world. He's a big client of the firm, but um, his view is that it'll be kind of dark for a while. But there's a lot of money set aside. A lot of people haven't been spending, and at one point, the latter half of next year. And so, how do you digest that information and think about credit selections? Where yes, it's an industry that we think is a little bit troubled at now, but like hospitality, but people are gonna to wanna to take their kids on vacation. People are gonna to wanna to go gamble. Um, you're, you got a tough job right now. Yeah, it's fun. It, it, it's, never, <laughs> it's never dull. All I can tell you is having gone through the 2009 downgrade, um, yep. it, one of those things is that you, um, people, it'll define you about how you make those decisions and and you talk about what, what you thought process and you don't have to get it all right because who knew that you know, I don't know, there was the vaccine didn't work, right? Um, and they had an, and it got delayed and whatever. So thanks, uh, Mike, I'm, we're going to move on to yeah, my um, pleasure. Thank, thank you. We're going to move on to Oliver. So Oliver, um, you know, funding solutions for indirectly, we're funding, um, you know, 
effectively the corporate market and uh, the corporate loan market. And it's either through different types of funding solutions and you have different client base. You sit on, you know, sort of head of sort of structuring, you know, portfolio solutions. And, you know, there's the, the ABL side and then there's the term side of it. And, you know, maybe stuff goes out and gets term, maybe it doesn't, but people want to have enough, you know, dry powder to do what they need to do. And so if you can give your perspective on this, and we talked about some things, so feel free to, to go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, so I sit, um, so at BNP, I sit on the desk that kind of spans, I guess, everything from CLOs as a market-based financing solution, all the way through things that we finance on our balance sheet, uh, which we call portfolio financing, and then, you know, the derivatives type solutions, which are loan total return swaps and things like that. So I think we've got a pretty good lens on our desk into the different alternatives, specifically for loans, um, and maybe more specifically even for middle market loans, which has been sort of, you know, largest growth engine, um, of at least our, our financing business over the last few years. And, you know, clearly, clearly, as Mike articulated, I mean, the CLO market is becoming a much larger portion in the middle market space and, um, you know, has become a very strong competitor, frankly, to a lot of the traditional bank financings uh, that have been done for, you know, BDCs, asset managers and the like for middle market or private credit assets. And I think, you know, the reason the reason for that is, is pretty straightforward. I think you've got, you know, structures now where the advance rates or the amount of leverage that you can get against middle market assets sort of mimics, uh, you know, what you can get from a portfolio financing, which is a, you know, call it 65 to 70 percent advance rate against a pool of middle market assets at a price that's, you know, probably based on recent experience wrapped around L plus 200, <clears throat> which is consistent with where banks were financing those assets um, in the past. So CLOs are really you know, the market's opened up in terms of um, investors, you know, receptivity to different types of strategies and assets in the private credit space. So the CLO market is definitely, um, you know, a product that middle market managers are using um, to finance these, uh, these loans. Now, I think, you know, CLOs versus, you know, what, I'll, what I call portfolio financing, which is the stuff that we keep on balance sheet, <clears throat> the structures are different. And there, I think there are a few differences in terms of how uh, managers, you know, should be thinking about them. Um, I think, you know, you've got CLOs on the one hand, which are very rules-based, rely heavily on the rating agencies. And, you know, I know Alex is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a market standardized instrument where you have to rely on some rules that are not necessarily in your control because investors or rating agencies dictate them. Whereas on the portfolio financing side, the way we approach that business is much more on a bespoke bilateral basis. So you've got revaluation mechanics that don't rely on ratings, rely on credit fundamentals, and ultimately there's more flexibility there. Um, so that's on the structural side. On the asset side, you know, I think there's, there's been a big a, a shift in the, um, in the private credit space where everything used to sort of be pretty straight down the fairway, plain vanilla private credit. Um, you know, to sort of your traditional middle market borrower. Um, I think now you've seen more and more investors venture out into different asset classes, you know, whether it's, you know, asset-based lending, uh, which relies more on a collateral pool, or whether it's recurring revenue loans or venture debt, things like that, which don't necessarily fit squarely into the rating agency models and may not necessarily fit squarely into investor appetite. So there's a disconnect there between what can be securitized in the CLO market uh, versus what can be financed in terms of bank bank lines. So I think that's another sort of key difference is that you know there's probably more flexibility in a bank financing facility currently than there is still in the, in the CLO market. Um, and then the last thing I, I'd say is a difference between you know CLOs versus portfolio financing is just kind of you know the relationship that sort of you know is implied in that financing format. So I think. The, um, you know, the CLO market, you know, as, as Mike knows, right, I mean, it's, it's very much about cultivating investors, um, finding the new ones, you know, figuring out, you know, who can anchor a deal. So it's, it's very, it's very based on, you know, sort of understanding the market and, and continually reassessing the market um, to figure out what, what's actually saleable. 
Um, and, you know, that's that can be good or bad, right? I mean, you've got, you know, investor pockets that are very fickle uh, and maybe here one day and, and gone the next, or, you know, they may dictate a structure or pricing that you may not like. Whereas on the bank side, it's much more bilateral uh, where, you know, I, I do think there's probably, you know, more stability to the funding, um, you know, through up and down cycles. Um, you know, a recent example that we've seen is just, you know, a lot of the COVID impacted industries, which, which I know Mike touched on as well, which, you know, probably gave a lot of agita to, um, to CLO investors and required a lot of, uh, you know, sort of explanation um, of the manager's strategy around that. On, on the portfolio financing side, you know, we review each asset on the way into our facilities, and then we pretty much have ongoing dialogue with managers because we have the right to revalue them if things really go south. But I think because of that, um, you know, we and, and other lenders like us, I think we're pretty sanguine in terms of how we addressed COVID impacted industries, because we did see that there was the sort of shorter term implications, which, you know, may just be a, a liquidity squeeze or, you know, some form of covenant relaxation on the underlying loans that didn't necessarily impact our view or the manager's view of the long term asset. Um, and then there were certain sectors where, you know, I, I think we, we probably, you know, were able to work with the manager a little bit more flexibly to rotate out of them, um, at least in the near term, to sort of shore up the whole portfolio. So I think, you know, that kind of relationship with the bank where you can have a conversation about individual credits and whether or not they should really be marked as dramatically as maybe the market says. Yeah, and, um, and, and, and I would say all of yeah, in our experience, because um, we were like the, you know, we, I mean, not, you know, tooting our horn, we're the number one arranger and lender, you know, counsel in the middle market space. It's relationship lending. And yeah. so maybe you can get a term out, maybe not at this time. Um, do you need a little bit of, maybe it eats a bit into your borrowing base, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll less, you know, we'll lend less against that. I mean, in terms of what might go into a CLO, maybe we'll break off another facility, um, you know, for certain industries we just talked about with Mike about certain industries that we think probably will take maybe a, uh, you know, a dive a little bit, um, but we'll rebound um, like the hospitality industry and the gaming industry and so, but that's a relation, it's relationship lending for people that really dig into the credits, which is different. Yeah. From no, and look, I mean, I, I do think it's also a spectrum, at least from where I sit in terms of <clears throat> what do you offer the client, right? Because we have a lot of facilities which start out as portfolio financings and then we peel off assets and turn them into CLOs because frankly, it gives our, our business more velocity. It allows the manager to access, um, you know, better economics um, and, you know, frankly, it's, it's probably what both sides should be doing, right? So, you know, we want to market check on what is ultimately on balance sheet financing. And I think it works if you have a structure that allows you to do both. And, um, and, and, and the things that we've done together and, you know, it's like, listen, Neil, I don't know whether this is going to get a, a term takeout, whether we'll hive off something, but right now they need some, they want financing lines. They want right. multiple, you know, or at least two in, 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 the, in the bigger scheme of accesses to capital, some of it gonna be longer term than others, but they want access to capital and they don't wanna lose. They wanna do everything in, in a, you know, a term securitization because they don't know what's ahead. Yeah, no, and I think the key will be to try to balance not only the sort of market versus bank execution, but also to balance the types of assets that can go into each. And one of the things that, you know, we've been working on a lot is just to create structures where you can finance you know, things that we would finance in portfolio financing, like recurring revenue, you know, maybe assets that are, are punitively treated by rating agencies, but we can get comfortable with. So we have the ability to finance those. And, and by the way, Mark is going to talk about that because he, he's got a, he's got a, he's got an issue. He'll be going last because that's, he, he agrees with you guys. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the idea would be that, you know, banks continue to finance those. Um, and then, you know, and then you have the more traditional, easily securitizable, um, middle market assets, right? So you've got some velocity around those market execution where possible, but then you've got some stability around financing assets that are maybe more off the run currently, given where the rating agencies or investors are. Now, you know, obviously there's risk management challenges and putting both of those things together in a portfolio for us, but I do think that is sort of the next frontier because ultimately, 
you know, a lot of private credit managers need to pivot or have been pivoting away from the sort of very crowded, you know, plain vanilla middle market space and whether or not that's, you know, moving to lower middle market, lower EBITDA or other sectors, you know, we have to adapt. All right. I'm going to leave it there because we're going to move on because you're going to, you're a great segue ultimately to Mark's uh, presentation because I think you guys are kindred spirits. So we're going to move over to the BSL side of things. Um, also no hair. Yeah. <laughs> There must be something in the middle market space. It just puts too much stress on you. <laughs> we all had hair at the beginning. I had one of my partners, we had a firm meeting and he, and he was bald, but he was also clean shaven. And I haven't seen him for eight months. Uh, again, he was at a partner's meeting and he looks like he could be on ZZ Top. So we're <laughs> going to look at, um, I, I'd like to go to Alex uh, Hugh now. I mean, we're looking at the BSL side of things. Um, we've had an interesting year. We've had a great <clears throat> initial run. Then we had disruption, we had deals that were being done for convenience, short-term uh, non-call periods. Um, and there's a lot to unpack on your side. And I'm just going to serve it up to you in terms of where you see that market volume-wise, expectations, where it is now. And I think leading into next year, you and I have talked about the fact that we're going to probably see some resets of those short duration deals. And um, But I guess the question is, is you know, you know, on the BSL side, it's you've got a lot to you, know, you got to market deals like we have we got Mike talking about like how he puts a portfolio together you got to go market deals and figure out what investors want yeah sure so uh, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of start with where we thought we would be in terms of issuance and kind of compare it to uh, where we are now um, so earlier this year you know we put out a research piece where we projected 80 billion of uh, new CELO issuance and uh, 70 billion of uh, reset and refi activity. And so if we fast forward now to you know, mid-November, you know, we're, we're, I'm seeing a number that's something like in the low 70s for uh, new issuance of, of CLOs, which you know, all things said, given what's happened this year, I think is actually a pretty robust uh, number. Um, you know, we've seen a couple of um, you know, new managers come to market and we've also seen a lot of activity just from, from serial issuers. So at least for, from a new issue side, I think, um, you know, it's, it's actually been a pretty healthy market this year. Um, you know, where, where things really kind of deviate from our projection is on, on the refi and reset side. So, you know, like I said, we projected 70 billion of refi reset activity. And right now I'm seeing a number that is uh, at right around 30. So a little less than half. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, we can talk about why, why you know, this is, this, part of the market has underperformed so much, but you know, let, let's kind of set the stage a little bit and um, just talk about uh, a little bit about, you know, what's happened since COVID. Um, Cause I think, you know, 2020 started actually pretty strong. Um, you know, we saw, we saw a bit of a refi wave in the BSL market. Saw a lot of demand in, in the um, shorter end of the curve. And so we saw actually a pretty steep AAA uh, term structure for, for the beginning of 2020. And then that all kind of stopped right, right when COVID hit in you know, February, March. Um, you know, as, as you would expect, when, when the market got really volatile in February, March, you know, there, a couple, there were a couple of things that, that happened. One, um, you know, lots of loans got downgraded. So um, you know, rating agencies were spending a lot of time um, refreshing their criteria, trying to determine what stresses they would run in, in order to rate these BSL deals. And I think secondly, and probably more significantly, um, we spent a lot of time working with our, our warehouse book, right? As you can imagine, in March and April, there was a tremendous amount of pressure on mark-to-market facilities. Um, so, you know, you, you, you could, there were a lot of situations where we would either convert them into um, non-mark-to-market facilities or, or try to get them turned out in, within the CLO market. Um, and, and then given, and I think, Another very kind of important point is that um, a lot of big bank investors have have kind of been sitting on the sidelines since COVID started. So, you know, I think the immediate impact of that is, you know, one smaller deals um, generally, you know, 300 to 400 million is probably the average deal size we're seeing these days. And secondly, um, I, I think since you're not working with as many lead investors and you're going to more syndicated uh, AAA route, you're, you're going to see a lot more uh, activity from, you know, call it the serial issuers, the, the, the tier one issuers who are on 
all, all the approved lists. So, um, you know, I think you, you'll see, and you know, we've seen fewer issuances from, from the smaller side of the market uh, in, in terms of managers. And so that, that kind of brings you through, um, you know, March and April. And I think with, with all the government stimulus that happened over the summer, kind of, you know, we've seen the market retrace much of that widening that, that we initially experienced um, uh, when COVID initially broke out. So uh, if I had to guess, uh, in, the, in the very beginning of the year prior to COVID, AAA spreads were roughly, you know, 110 to 120 for, for, for a new issue deal. Um, those blew out to, you know, the mid 200s to, to the high 200s in, during the peak of the crisis. And then, you know, in September, August, we were back to call it a 130s, 140s. So, you know, we were only 20 or so basis points away from where we started this year. Um, so, like I said, um, you know, shorter deals um, and, and some more, um, you know, smaller deals are, are was this kind of the theme that we're seeing this year. And, um, you know, I, I think with the recent news of, of the potential vaccine, I think the market's taking some time to kind of rethink where spreads should be uh, for this kind of next set of deals. So, um, so, you know, I think so Alex, I, not to, I'm going to interrupt you, but I just want to say is that it's an interesting because we had Bill Ackman on. He was quoted um, in a conference in London on you know, Tuesday saying that he thinks uh, the vaccine will actually lead, at least in the near term, and I'm paraphrasing, to more de more defaults and more, you know, credit um, related issues because people are going to think that there's a wonder drug and people will, you know, not socially uh, distance and they won't wear their masks. And um, he made a lot of money earlier this year. I, based on what I can see in the market right now, I wouldn't bet against him uh, at, the, at this moment, but it's everybody trying to digest this and like it's human nature. Like what are people going to go out? Are people going to go? I mean, then we have in, in New Jersey and New York, and I'm sure it's spreading across in Ohio and other places that there are, you know, restrictions that are becoming uh, more restrictive as it were um, than it was because there's a huge spike. So the vaccine is just this ultimately is probably a good thing, but near term might be. Alex. Uh, sorry, I, I think you cut out for the last. Oh, I, I'm, well, I guess, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Uh, now, now I can, yeah. Okay, I was just saying is that there's the whole vaccine uh, issue is whether or not there's an, um, you know, how that impacts the markets in the near term. Some people are taking a negative view on it, like Bill Ackman saying that people are going to have a false sense of security because they think that they can go out and socialize more and it may cause a, an even more increased spike in COVID rates so that ultimately the vaccine is a good thing, but in the near term, it might not be felt until the back end of 2021. I, I mean, I totally agree. I think most people don't expect the vaccine to be widely available for, for amount, you know, a good amount of time, but I think I think the market you know, welcomes some, some good news and you know, I think it does put, you know, show that there might be some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, now, now the path to getting there might be a little rocky, but um, yeah, at least this seems like there, there might be a path there. Um, and so I think, um, you know, right now, I think the market's really focused on, a, you know, from a structural perspective, um, a couple things, um, you know, and I won't cover these in too much detail because I think there's another panel that covers more of the documentation side. But uh, I think, you know, we've kind of been focused on three trends in, in CELO documents. One is the uh, emergence of bond buckets again, uh, post the uh, Volcker rule update. Uh, two, um, managers have been focused on getting some flexibility to get workouts in, in, into their deals. So we've seen variations there uh, on that language. And then finally, uh, I feel like we've been talking about this for a long time, but and I think the uh, transition from LIBOR is still a, a relevant topic for, for, for a lot of CLOs. And so, you know, we've been focused on that. And I think, you know, we're going to start to have some discussions around potential reset activity. Um, but if you ask me, I think most of it's going to be centered around um, you know, the deals that were done earlier this year. Um, so the really wide uh, kind of triple A's that were done through, you know, from April through, through July, because um, those, those will come off the one you're not calls and will be pretty, I think it should be pretty obvious candidates. Um, 
Yeah, I think the 2018 vintage, probably not so much because those spreads were pretty tight. And then, you know, finally, I think, you know, the, the, the 16 through 17 CLOs could be um, reset. I think the question is how much of a equity injection we need to put into those to make those work and just kind of where, where the market is versus where those liabil liabilities are today. Um, just, I think you have to take a deeper look at that to see if, see if the math works. So um, we'll, I, I think, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there because we're gonna, so yeah. you've got the BSL and then we're gonna transition to the middle market side of things. I think that, um, you know, when you talk about the difference between the BSL and the middle market, um, which Alex also does, um, but I think more focuses on the BSL side. I mean, you're looking at small, smaller EBITDA companies and um, it's a different market. So I'm just, Mark, I'm just gonna serve it up to you. Just talk about what you see in the landscape of middle market CLOs. And, um, you know, we've talked about some things and some things we're touching about are recurring revenue loans, et cetera, but take it away, please. Sure. Let me uh, start maybe just by giving the state of affairs and then get into some themes. Um, from a volume perspective on a new issue basis, we're pretty much back to 2016 levels. Uh, in 2016, there were approximately 8.6 billion the middle market new issue CLOs. And 17, 18, 19 was 13 and a half to 14 and a half billion. And today we're at about 8.5 billion, I think we'll probably end up finishing the year closer to 10 billion, but that's still a significant reduction than 17, 18, 19. You know, you're down close to 35, 40%. And we all know it's partially due to COVID, but I think uh, one of the points Michael had made, which was collateral availability, he thought actually there wasn't really an issue there. And I think that's probably true in the BSL world managers that I've certainly spoke to in the middle market world said for a period of time, not, you know, six months of the year, um, there were fewer loans being originated due to tighter underwriting standards in the middle market space. So less underlying loans, less middle market CLOs. And so I think that was maybe a little bit of a theme difference between middle market and, and BSL. Um, one of the things I see in the middle market, which has been true pretty much uh, certainly in the last five years, which is the market continues to be dominated at the AAA level by the same 20 to 25 uh, large AAA anchor orders. And I think what needs to happen is there needs to be further education by middle market managers. And a lot of them are going out there and doing a good job describing what their product is, because you can have guys, managers who do a wonderful job of small EBITDA companies some other managers do a great job of larger EBITDA. Some folks do sponsored, some folks do non-sponsored, some folks do more distressed. But understanding within the landscape of the middle market CLO that you could have multiple players and also multiple winners. What I find particularly interesting today in middle market CLOs is the basis spread between middle market CLO AAAs and BSL um, AAA spreads. Historically, um, it's been about a 35 to 40 basis points spread difference. And today you're actually seeing a 60 basis points sort of spread difference approximately. And so why is that the case? And really the case is for a couple of reasons. One is there's clearly less uh, liquidity in the middle market CLOs, or at least perceived less liquidity in middle market AAA CLOs. But for those of us who have been in the industry for a long period of time, I could tell you, you know, during the financial crisis, there really wasn't any liquidity or very little liquidity in the BSL or middle market CLOs. So on a day-to-day -day basis, yes, there is more, um, but in periods of extreme stress, I don't think actually there's as much as people think there is. The other reason, clearly, there's less transparency in the underlying loans. Now, managers will talk to you about their loans, they'll share stats, information, and names, um, but it's just not the same as, as in BSL. And the BSL CLO um, obviously has more diversity. So that's just a theme that I think needs to continue to, to, to go on, which is an education of more investors, bringing more investors into, into the market. Um, it's an exciting product. I know Oliver was talking on bank facilities and CLOs. I think the right answer is often to have both. Um, even though, there's a person that you could talk to for revaluation events in a bank facility. 
The reality is, is sometimes having non-mark to market term match financing, which is the case in CLOs, is actually very attractive to managers. Um, because even though you, know, you hope that you're gonna have a good partner with the banks, things change, people change, and to have a rules-based facility actually is kind of exciting. Another so, thing- so, uh, I was just gonna say to you is that one of the things that we heard is that like one of the expectations for maybe doing new deals is that some people who had facilities in place which were experiencing a lot of reval events might be pushed to the term market because, uh, and that's actually one of your colleagues. So, um, yep. um, and, but I think that's an interesting dynamic of moving from, a, you know, you know, kind of an ABL facility to a, a term facility. Um, I'm sorry, continue. No, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. Um, another theme, and I know we talked about this was reoccurring revenue loans, which Oliver was talking about and actually do fit well into a bank facility. But software and technology are making up a bigger and bigger component of the overall market economy. You know, it's in everything you could think of, education, hospitality, financial services, energy, real estate. Um, and so what I see happening is right now, they, those particular loans don't fit well within a CLO. And the reason they don't fit well within a CLO is primarily because the major rating agencies have difficulty providing credit estimates. And the reason they have difficulty providing it, credit estimates is these companies are often um, EBITDA negative or very, very low EBITDA, even though on a free cash flow basis, they're actually performing very, very well. And it's just that they're reinvesting their money into research and development to gain market share, to create better products. Um, so I think over time, there's gonna need to be a change um, to how to deal with these businesses, particularly the successful businesses, um, from a credit estimate perspective, because it's continuing to make a bigger, bigger part of the economy. And to be, to, I think bank facilities deal with them well, but I think there would be a bunch of managers that are still interested in having non-mark to market term match financing to deal specifically with these assets. The, the one other theme, um, because I know we're running a little low on time, was, and I think Michael brought it up, was the triple C basket. I think investors have to appreciate the fact that even though in the middle market CLO space, you often see a 17.5% triple C basket, I think they need to get comfortable with the idea that that basket might change um, from manager to manager. And the reason for that, and they really need to underwrite the manager's investment process and their strategy. Because in the middle market CLO space, the equity is usually the manager's equity. These are financing trades. And so what you don't want is for the manager to necessarily do unnatural things, as Michael pointed out, potentially have to sell credits or do something else just because of this basket, when it's really potentially in the best interest of everyone um, to have them work it out. Okay. Um, so uh, I, th I think we're, we're you're, you're really good. You were actually one minute under time, um, even though you were, you, you were, thanks for talking quickly. <laughs> it's all about uh, condensing it. I think uh, there was one uh, question we, you know, we talked about uh, one of the questions that came in early was to Alex, just about how we see the end of the year. I think Alex, um, the view is that like, just based on the deal work that we have in front of us, um, it's going to be quite busy um, leading into next year. Um, I think the, Another question that came in more to you, Oliver, was portfolio adjustment, exactly what that kind of meant. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, you were on the chat too, so if you can maybe address that and I think we'll wrap up. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I think generically what I meant by that is that, you know, a, a portfolio financing facility that's attached to a, you know, a BDC or a larger fund, for example, offers some flexibility and that the manager isn't necessarily financing all the assets in the fund. Um, or in the BDC in the in the in the portfolio financing. So the idea is to rotate, you know, some assets that are maybe sitting unlevered in the BDC or in the fund into the asset financing facility to, you know, either diversify or reduce certain sectors, things like that. Uh, which, you know, it, again is is just, you know, something that we saw during the sort of, you know, the last couple of months as a way for people to address revaluation events, which, you know, as Mark correctly pointed out have also been um, a major reason for people to shift to CLOs. So that's a very valid point. So I think we, we've, we've kind of come to our a bit of our time limit here, um, but I would say this, there's a, there was a tremendous amount of information to unpack here. 
Um, we're, <laughs> we've got things that have never occurred uh, in our lifetimes. Um, we have to kind of digest all this. Everybody who's uh, taken a view on the market um, or just trying to understand the market. Um, I certainly think the bike has the, the tougher job in terms of figuring out, you know, where he uh, deploys money. Um, and then, uh, you know, and, um, you know, I, I think of Oliver having to figure out how he finances against it, but that's going to be a conversation. Um, and for Alex, he's going to figure out how he can market his deals and how we might have to limit certain sectors and, in, and respond to investor comments. And I, and I think about on the middle market space, um, I think that it's just the market will grow. I think it's, I mean, one of the things I saw, and I have a good friend of mine um, who co-heads uh, an ABS group and he was like sending me data and, and he said that, listen, I think the economy is kind of moving more to the suburbs, rents for people wanting to rent space in the suburbs is going up. I, I think what we've seen in transition in this credit economy is that the world, we knew where the economy was going to go. It's going to go more virtual. It, this, the COVID just um, as, as, you know, sped it up. I mean, I just think that's the case. So I think for, um, I, I think optimistically, um, uh, I, I think I'm looking to the back end of 2021 where things are going to be really good. I expect to be really busy in 2000, you know, in, in the early part of 2021 with just some resets and refis. Um, but I think that there's so much uncertainty that none of us <laughs> figure out. But I, I think we'll all have jobs for trying to figure it out. And we appreciate everybody for participating in the panel.